now I'd like to talk about a few things to keep in mind when performing your mallet audition piece. First off, it's important to set yourself up for success in your preparation. That means choosing an appropriate mallet for the register of the instrument that you're playing in. Since we're playing so high on the marimba, I've chosen a medium hard mallet. Uh, this is the Vic Firth Robert Van Sice M114. It's hard enough where I'm getting a clear sound and rhythmic clarity, but it's still soft enough where I'm not sounding brittle or harsh as if I'm playing the marimba with xylophone mallets or something. Now, if this is a piece that you can ask to play on the xylophone, you should also prepare some xylophone mallets for that as well. I think a medium soft or even a natural rubber might sound good. Now, as far as musical interpretation goes, there are a few things you should be cautious of. First off, in this publishment, there are accents written throughout the piece. It's important not to interpret these maybe as a marching band style, a very articulate and, and, and different sound, right? We're not looking for this. Okay, we're looking for more of a fluid and rounded sound. So when you see these accents, Think of them less as different height strokes, but more as points of emphasis. And from there, you can round up your stick height to that point of emphasis, and then round down. So that kind of arc phrasing I'm talking about would sound like this. I think this is gonna allow for a more musical interpretation of the piece. Now, as you're playing, it's important to make sure that you're playing the marimba in the right spot, meaning you want to avoid any of the nodal points or the spot on the bar right above where the string goes through. Notice how it gets a much more dead sound than the center or the very edge. It's important that you decide where you're going to be hitting the bar and practice that routinely. That way, it's not a guess and it's not a gamble. So when you go in and you begin to play in an audition setting or under pressure, you don't have to worry about remembering these things because they've become habit. Now, if you look further into the piece, specifically starting at letter A, we begin to get into a more repeated pattern, meaning we're doing the same thing bar after bar. This in particular, When you have the repeated note in the right hand and then the changing notes in your left, it's important that you decide how you're going to make this musically interesting. I try to bring out this kind of bounce between my left hand, and I try to bring out when it changes notes to the D because the change is what's going to be interesting. So my phrasing sounds like this. I've kind of put this arc on there. For me, this helps me maneuver this passage without it sounding too redundant because the next bar is the same thing, just starting on D. And then the next bar is the same thing starting on E. So not only knowing that I'm doing the same thing, but knowing that it's moving up melodically is going to help dictate what I do musically there as well. So, not only am I increasing volume and adding that little arc each measure, but each time it goes up from C to D, and then at E, I'm actually increasing my volume there too to try to add, once again, some musical direction. Now, another part where I think might take some special attention is going to be the second line from the bottom on the first page, or four after B. We're given a very large leap. C, B, C, A, B, A, B, G sharp. 
And if not prepared correctly, you could find yourself having some very uncomfortable doubling reaching those long distances. And so I choose to start this measure with my left hand. That way my right hand has a whole eighth note from the E to the uh to maneuver that passage without having to worry about any uncomfortable doublings. Now, choosing this sticking, I've realized that, well, I need to make sure that the bar before this, I set myself up properly to end on the left hand. So after I've penciled in my left hand lead on the fourth bar of B, I go back to the third bar of B and I make sure that I end that bar with my right hand so that the next bar starts with my left. It's always important that once you've written a sticking in, that you work your way backwards to make sure that it's something that you can get yourself into comfortably. Now, again, we have the three bars before C, where we have the same, the same idea, the same motive played over and over again. Again, I suggest bringing out the moving notes, as well as adding a bit of a crescendo to add the musical motion. The same would go for two before C. And I've actually added a bit of a, uh, a bit of an arc there as well, if you listen. And I played the crescendo and decrescendo written in by the publisher because it works beautifully. Now, let's talk a little bit about the musical direction of the piece. This is a sonata, meaning that we expect there to be three parts. The exposition, where we are presented with the theme. The development, which is where that theme is, is kind of changed, embellished, and modulates. And then the recapitulation, where we get the theme again back in the opening key. So knowing those three sections, it's very important that you phrase accordingly. So our theme is the opening measure. Those two measures comprise of that opening theme. Now, you'll notice that we get that same pattern starting at B. And it's continually changing. At C, we get it again, this time in G. And it's not until D, box D, that we get it back in F again. So knowing that, that can maybe help you in your phrasing decisions. Again, talking about the piece in a stylistic manner, Knowing that this is a Baroque composition, the performance practice of the Baroque music is one of highly embellished music, meaning that the performers would add notes that weren't necessarily on the page. I've chosen to add a trill on the second to last line, the first measure of the last page. I've trilled on the E natural because this is a cadence point and an appropriate place to add such an embellishment. This shows that not only can I play the music as written, but I can also play it stylistically appropriate, which incorporates performance practice that isn't in the music. So it shows that I've gone out and listened to recordings, and I've really familiarized myself with this piece. And that's going to help set you aside from some others who are just playing what's on the page. Now, lastly, it's important that you are picking a tempo in which you're going to be very successful at. The written tempo here says Allegro quarter note equals about 120. Now, I've gone out and listened to a few recordings of the piece, and in my experience, I've found many performances of high quality somewhere around quarter note equals 108 or 110 on the fast side. Now for me, I think that's great because not only is that slower giving me more time to think, to aim, to phrase, but it's also going to allow me to relax a bit. So again, when you choose your tempo, look at 
the maybe the fastest or for me what was the most difficult passage was the large leaps or some of the uh, other passages with extra accidentals so when I chose my tempo rather than just singing the opening in my head I went and I sang through those passages making sure that the tempo I was picking was in fact slow enough to where I could maneuver those passages. Again, best of luck with your preparation. I wish you all a, a, a good performance and have fun.